Lord in the life of many other ministers and, and, and individuals in this area. God, I pray that you continue to use that new person that can't be here to hear the Lord. And what you have so much, most gracious, no name. Amen. Good morning, y'all. Oh, come on, this is the second service. Y'all got no excuse. Morning, y'all. Stand up with us. Let's sing together.
this one is Only Trust Him. Um, and it's just a story in the gospel. So if you ever have a hard time sharing that with somebody, I guess you can sing the song to them. Or if you can't sing, just say the words to them. But uh, we can, it doesn't matter if you can sing or not. Let's all sing together right now.
2006, the Lord set me free, gave my life to Christ. Um, knew early on God was calling us to do something more than just be a church member. And uh, 2010, He called us into ministry. And as any good Baptist would do in 2012, we made a decision to surrender. Uh, we wrestled with God for a couple of years, and, um, but finally we surrendered to that. In 2013, I started uh, my first position in ministry at. Central Baptist Church of the Journey Campus, and then uh, a couple years ago we moved to Williams. So that's just a brief story of who I am. I've been married to my wife. We actually are junior high sweethearts. We started dating in ninth grade. We've been married for 13 years, and we have two little girls. Uh, Grace will be 10 in October, and Elise is 7, and we have another one that's new in December, which is a whole other discussion. But um, anyway, actually, my mom is from Lisa. Um, and I tell, I'm going to pull my phone out. I'm going to do this, but I had to text her a question because she actually um, taught at Manila. She was at Manila. And I, she does not have years. I asked her what years she taught, and she taught me second grade and sixth grade. So, anyway. <laughs> um, but she was a couple years, a couple of speech therapists for a couple of years. So, her name is Kathy Howe. It's Kathy Bridges. She's from Leesville. My dad's from Monette. I actually grew up playing golf at Big Lake. I played that course a thousand times. So this is kind of like coming home for me. Um, it's been awesome. So after the first service, I had so many people come up and tell me they knew my family. Um, and so uh, I'm just really, really excited to be here. Uh, and then I love your church because I love your leadership. Your pastors, uh, I just met Larry, but your pastors, Matt and Chris, were some of the first people when I could, went to Williams that made me feel welcome. And they, but, you know, they both came in. And just, it was almost like a friendship that I didn't know existed. Um, so I'm confident that you're in really good hands. Um, so I'm humbled and, and excited to be here. Um, and I want to just kind of tell you sort of my, my method of preaching, I guess. Um, 
because I have never heard, that's a good friend of mine, I've never heard him preach, but I'm going to probably spend 10 minutes trying to walk us into attention before we actually dig into the passage, um, because I want you to feel what this passage is addressing, um, and so I'm just telling you out on the front end, because it'll take us about 10 minutes to get there, so don't think we're never going to get in the Bible, I promise you that's what's going to drive everything, but we've got to get there. Um, and so the, the title this morning, like the thing I want us to talk about is called The One Thing. The One Thing. And when I think about this generation, this time in our culture, in the world, I believe it's the most exhausting time we've ever been in. There are so many things that all of us do. Um, technology has thrown so much in our face. We're used to when you left work at 5 o'clock, you left work at 5 o'clock. Now, because of this, we get emails and text messages, and uns it, it, you never leave. And then sports have evolved to be year-round. We're used to baseball was just in the spring, maybe early summer. Now it's year-round. Same thing with all other sports. And those aren't bad. Just, I, I think this is the most exhausting generation we've ever been in. And I think that this idea creates tension in our lives. And this just the nature of where we are creates tension and stress in our lives. And so when I think about the idea of the one thing, though, I think about a 90s movie called City Slickers. How many of you have seen City Slickers? Okay, it's a, it's a, it, it, I can't recommend it. There's quite a bit of language and stuff in it. But there's one scene in there that really paints a picture of where we're going. Um, and so in this movie, you got Billy Crystal's the, he is the City Slicker. He is the main character. His character's name is Mitch. Um, and Mitch is a City Slicker. Right? I mean, I'm pretty redneck. I'm, you know, I like to have four and third box. I don't mean that offensive if you think that is, but that's just how I kind of like it myself. So, um, but <clears throat> Billy Crystal is the opposite of that. And him and his buddies go on this two week long uh, cattle drive. And the storyline is kind of this idea that he, his life from the outside looks really nice, right? It looks, we look at it, everything seems put together, his family's doing well, but inside he, he's in shambles. He feels like he doesn't know his purpose in life, he doesn't know his meaning in life. And he goes on this cattle drive. And I would dare say, in our generation, we do that a lot. We try to look the part really well. Right? We have an Instagram picture, Facebook picture, that everything looks great. And inside, maybe we're in turmoil. So anyway, he goes on this, this cattle drive, and he is riding alongside this cowboy named Curly. Um, Curly's just a tough dude. Just, Curly's a cowboy name. You can't really um, argue that he's not legit. And he looks over, and he looks at Billy Crystal. Mitch, you know what secret life is? And this climactic event begins to build a movie because it's like, this is what he wants. He's fixing to find out the meaning of life. And he's looks at, he looks at Curly and he's like, yes, I want to know. That's what I'm here for. And he does this. He just puts his finger up. And so Mitch is like, your finger? And he's like, no, one thing. And so it continues to build because it's like, man, this is the one thing that I came for. I'm fixing to learn. And he says, what is the one thing? And Curly says, you have to figure it out. And so it deflates the moment. Everything's kind of like, oh. And I tell you that because all of us, when we're born, um, look for the one thing. Because we're born separated from our Creator, right? We're born separated because of sin. We find value in life, purpose and meaning from our Creator. The Creator of anything is what defines its value. So because we're born separated from God, we go through life looking for value. And the only place I'll give you a spoiler, the only place you can find is Jesus. But we try to find it in so many other one things. Right? We look for it in sports and relationships and money and all this other stuff. And what we end up with is a bunch of one things. And not just one thing in life. And here's the thing about us. We have one directional hearts. We have a God-given desire for God gives us all the desire for approval, but the only place we can find that approval is in Jesus. And we try to find it in a whole bunch of other places. And so, when we get in this position where we have all of these one things, we feel kind of stuck. Right? You ever feel like you're literally stuck to the floor? Like, I can't move forward, I can't go back and forth anymore, I can't move side to side, I'm just, this is who I am. Right? This is what I'm going to be for the rest of my life, and this is what I, my existence is going to look like. Stuck to the floor. I, I don't know about you, but I do that a lot. Where I get in those positions and I'm just I'm stuck. I 
and I get stagnant. What happens when I do that? I'm already a cynical person and sarcastic and all of that. I become overly cynical and I become critical of everything. And when I become critical of everything, it's a very dangerous place for me. And I become spiritually just really, really dry. Um, and so I'm sure you all have felt that tension. We're going to talk about a couple examples just to kind of walk us all into that, right? But for me, one of the ways that this happens day to day, not day to day, but um, so on the rare occasion that I am off and my wife is at work, I'm trying to be the good husband and do every piece of laundry and I can sweep them off the floors and, you know, I do all the dishes, I do all this stuff. And it's probably not done very good, honestly, but, you know, I do. And my wife gets home from work and she's like, oh, thank you for what you did. And she goes and just goes on with the rest of the afternoon. And I'm just deflated because I expected this huge response of praise, right? I expected this great thing and early on in our marriage, um, I mopped all the floors in our house with straight pine salt. Guys don't do that. Okay? It's like an ice cream. You know, it took literally months to get it where you could, you know, safely walk on it. Um, but as a husband, I should do that. I and mean, we should want to take care of the house and take care and support our wife and sacrificially do those things. But my one thing in that moment was her approval. I wanted her praise. It had really nothing to do with me wanting to serve my wife. It was just me wanting her praise, right? And so, um, and I think we all go through life doing this, like from one thing to the next. Like in elementary, you can't wait to get to junior high, right? You can't wait to take that step. Personally, I didn't like junior high, so, but you know, maybe you will. Um, you get junior high, then you want to get to high school, and then when you're in high school, you can't wait to drive. Then once you keep driving, you can't wait to graduate, and you can't wait to go to college, and you can't wait to get married. I mean, like, we live life that way, one thing to the next. And then you get out of college, you can't wait to make enough money where you don't have to go pay check to paycheck. You can't wait till you can retire. You can't wait till you have the house. I mean, like, we are wired in our sinfulness to do that. And what happens is we do so many one things. We have so many focuses that we are living distracted. We're not doing any of them very well. And so I have a visual because I'm I, when you deal with college students. If I just stand up there and talk, they'll, they'll fall asleep or not pay attention or be on the phone. So I have to keep them awake. So I know that y'all have football now. Okay? We, have, we didn't have football value when I was there, but I know you do now. But I know that this town is deeply rooted in basketball because I used to battle some guys here. So who thinks they're the best ball handler in here? Look, nobody wants that. Everybody, somebody needs to just nominate somebody. Honor me Okay, come on. Hey, it is what it is, man. It is what it is. Tell me your name. Connor. All right. Play button. Okay. Just take that one. Just dribble it. So how long do you think you can dribble that? Forever? Okay. Stay there while I preach the rest of the sermon. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you can move, right? You feel? Dribble the ball. Can you move forward? Get back up. Okay. Can you do two? Okay. Do two. Can you still move forward a little bit? Alright, hey, back up. You do three. You want to try? Okay. I've used this illustration many times. Y'all give it up for Connor. Let me explain to you what I'm doing. What I'm trying to illustrate. I need like 10 of these, but I can only carry three at a time. So, here's the deal. Though. Right? Say this is your one thing in life. If it's just one thing, I can move. I can go, I can do, God can tell me to go forward, I can go forward, He can tell me to go side, I can go side. If I have two, maybe. If I have three, there's no way. I've, I've done this illustration many times and nobody's ever been able to dribble three. Now there are some crazy dudes that go to YouTube, you can see. Here's what happens, right? This is work. This is family. This is sports, we'll say. And there could be 10 of them, right? And what we try to do is we try to keep them all going. With our energy, with our effort, we have so many one things, it's like I've got to keep So if you can imagine, I couldn't do it very long, I did, must be out of breath, it would be hard to hear. But if I could bounce that one, try to go over and bounce that one, then try to keep that one, it would be exhausting. That's how we live life so many times. We have so many things, and then this is what our faith looks like. Flat. It's not round, it won't bounce. 
It's there, but it's, it's not useful. And what I, what I think we do is we live in a world of distraction. Because the only thing we're focused on is how do I keep that ball bouncing and that ball bouncing and that ball bouncing. And we have so many one things. And when we do that, we feel stuck. Like if, if my existence was to keep these three basketballs bouncing, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't move forward or backwards. I couldn't go anywhere. All I would have to do is stay right here. I think we do that in our faith. Or we, we know Jesus, or maybe you don't know Jesus and you're trying to figure out this whole God thing, but you're looking for purpose and value and meaning in life, and you try to find it in all these things, and you're trying to keep them going. And when that happens, we feel stuck, because you can't move. And when we feel stuck, right, it feels hopeless. Right? Like, not in a, maybe in a, I don't know, Way, but maybe if you know Jesus, you still feel like this is all my existence is going to do. God has called me to do specific things and I can't move because I've got so much distraction. And then you come to church and you hear a sermon like this. I just want to clear the air. And you feel worse. Right? We come to church and you're like, well, you're saying this is my faith. And I get it. And, and it makes you feel bad and leave more exhausted because you're thinking, well, i got to hear up another ball and keep it going somehow. That's not what God wants. That's not what I want. I think that God has a very specific message to help us figure out how do we still do these things well while making this the one thing. And that's what I want us to look at. So here's what's crazy. This generation is not the first generation to feel this tension. The previous generation is not. It's been there since the beginning of time. It's just existed in different ways. And even the people that walk with Jesus felt this. And that's why we're going to be in the book of Luke. Um, chapter 10. And so I want to give a little bit of context to the book of Luke and then we'll dive in. Um, we'll start in verse 38 in just a second. So the Gospel of Luke is an account of the life of Jesus um, and it starts out with the prophecy of John the Baptist and the prophecy of Jesus' birth and the Christmas story and he kind of hits the ground running, right? And the storyline, you have these disciples with Jesus and they have this mindset that Jesus is the king. And he is going to go into Jerusalem and overthrow everybody and take over. And physically set up his temple and, and his kingship. And they're all going to be like, you know, his right hand guy is what they're thinking. In chapter 9, Jesus drops a bomb on him. and says he's going to the cross. He's going to be crucified. And so he has radically transformed their world. And then in chapter 10, he sends a 70 out. Um, and so... Let's jump in in verse 38. It says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home. We're going to work through this kind of verse by verse. And so the context of this passage is really powerful. Jesus is on his way to the cross. Like he is going to be crucified. This house is in a, in a village called Bethany, which is like two and a half miles from Jerusalem. So he's close. Like he's really close he is God. He knows what's coming. And he stops at this house. And my first inclination is always to be like, well, he knows what's coming. He's just going to stop off and just kind of take a rest and eat. You know, like, and, and there may be some truth to that, but here's what I think. He's just dropped this bomb in him. That he is not going to be with them. Um, and he knows what is coming. And he is trying to encourage them with something that they can continue to carry on the mission that he has for. He, has, he knows that this is a very specific time for him to teach them how are they supposed to live with him as their one thing and actually go and make disciples as he's going to call them. And so the, the context of this passage is really powerful. It's not just a conversation. It's a very pivotal moment in the movement of God on earth. So he sits down, he goes in this house, and if you're a person that like underlines in your Bible or highlights in your Bible, I tend to box around things. I would box around where it says open her home to you. Because here's what I think. I think that this poses an allegorical question we can ask ourselves every day. Am I open to Jesus? 
Are you open to Jesus coming into your life? Whether you know him, if you're a believer, you still have to be open to hearing from him and listening to him and obeying him. And sometimes we have so many distractions that Jesus could kick the door down in our life and we wouldn't even know it. He could bust through the doors of my life at certain times and I wouldn't even know it was there. Because I'm so distracted trying to keep all of these things going. So we have to ask ourselves, day in and day out, am I open to Jesus today? Am I listening to the Spirit of God inside of me as He guides and directs me? Or am I focused on just doing and keeping everything going? So He goes into this house, and it's, it's the home of Mary and Martha. And they were not strangers to Him. Um, they had a brother named Lazarus, who you know the story, right? Jesus raised from the dead. Um, and so, <clears throat> anytime you look at scripture, you need to unfold the characters. And so you've got Mary, you got Martha and Jesus. And then our third character comes in in verse 39. It says, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. And just as any, most family gathering is drama, right? <laughs> verse 40 says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had, had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So she's like, look, my sister's just chilling, sitting there, and I'm running around doing all this work. I need you to make her get up. And I think that all of us, we have those people in our family. Um, you have to go here. I used this example in the last service. If my mom was sitting here, I would still say it because we pick up. My mom, she's not really a Martha, but she's the overachiever in our family. Like when it's time for a family gathering, like if we were going to have Thanksgiving, she would have like two kinds of turkey, like a fried and smoked turkey and a Boston butt and brisket and pulled pork and like 14 types of meat and 10 things of potato salad and beans. And, you know, we, we always have like 16 desserts. And I'm like, Mom, we, we, we literally, at Thanksgiving, we could probably eat all of y'all at one time. No problem. You know, we all have those people, right? The overachiever. And I think that's part of what Martha was. Um, but then you've got Mary. So I want to I kind of compare and contrast those two for just a second. So we can, maybe you can identify with one or the other. Um, so Martha was obviously the older sister. We know that she recognized Jesus as the Messiah because she said, Lord. Right, so she recognized him as the Messiah. One thing that I would again underline is she's distracted. The word in there is actually it says Martha was distracted with all her preparation. Because here's the deal, right? There was no phone, so Jesus didn't call ahead and say, Hey Martha, we're gonna stop by your house and like Jerusalem, right? He just showed up. And I don't know about you, I don't know all of you, but I know my wife. And if if Jesus walked through the front door of our house, she would be like in DEF CON 4 mode. Sweeping and cleaning and stuffing stuff in closets and closing doors, right? Like, that's what I think that's really what Martha's doing. She's like, Man, we gotta get the house clean. Like, I didn't know you were coming, Jesus, you know. And then she's also trying to prepare food, right? Because if you know, get called out to the demos and pick up some good foods, and it wasn't even like she couldn't even walk to the fridge, they had to, they had to slaughter an animal and do it. So she is in like crazy mode trying to get all this stuff. And then you got Mary, right? Mary's a younger sister. She realizes Jesus is the Messiah because she's sitting at his feet. Culturally, that was a huge deal, right? Women didn't sit at the feet of men unless there was some major significance. So she clearly recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. And she literally, she just wanted to soak in what he was saying. She just wanted to hear and, and listen and be with Jesus. And so you've got this overarching situation where you've got two women. And they both recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They both want to worship him, but in totally I would dare to say most of in this, us in this room identify with Martha. I know I do. Um, because it's so easy for me to look around and say, man, I have given my life to ministry. And you guys serve and you're here and you look around. And we played the comparison game, right, on Facebook. Disclaimer, nobody looks a real life on Facebook. Like, it's not always itchy, you know. I don't ever put on Facebook, I want to strangle my girls today. Sometimes I do. I don't, but I do. Right? And so I look on Facebook and I see this guy who, man, 
doesn't do anything for the Lord. He's got all this money and all this stuff. And I play the comparison game. I'm like, God, why? Why does he have that? I don't. Right? We do those things. You know, it's just like we play that comparison game. We look at why do we not have the same level of commitment? And it's not just the ministry, right? In school, right? You guys do group projects and you got one person who doesn't do their part. It's just natural, right? And it's frustrating. And Maybe at work, you're the one you feel like you do all the work, and you got a coworker who just sits on the stool. Maybe it's a relationship or marriage. You feel like I do all the work, and they do nothing. Like we we exist in this tension, right? Maybe it's a sports team, basketball team, where you feel like you're always having to run because that one guy will do this thing, right? We we know what that feels like. I think I tell you that because I think that's what Martha was feeling in that moment. She was like, look. Why am I doing all this work? And she's just sitting there. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is how Jesus responds. He says in verse 30, 41 and 42, he says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus addresses Martha with this double Names is Martha Martha. My first inclination in that is like if I'm talking to my girls and I say it to Melissa, they don't respond, so I say it louder, right? And I was like, Grace, Grace. You know, um, it's not really like that, but you know what I mean. Um, and so, but that's not how you look at the, the way it's written in Greek. It's actually very endearing. It's like, Martha, like, calm down. Like, I, I, I think he's like, look, I understand, just, just calm down. And then he tells her the root of her frustration. And here's what I believe. I believe the root of her frustration is the root of ours. A lot of times when we have all these things going and we feel this tension, it's because of what Jesus says to Martha. He says, you are worried and upset about so many things. He says you're worried. Now the Greek here does not just mean worried, like a feeling of worried, like I'm worried about a test or I'm worried about, you know, my grass dying thousand degrees outside. It's this idea of a life of anxiety. And anxiety is driven off of fear. And anxiety is typically we cope with it by distraction. Right? Like, so let's say that you win a trip to Disney World, but you have to fly and you're terrified of flying. Right? Well, you could do you take some melatonin, try to go to sleep, you read a book, you choose to go, you listen to a lot of music, you watch a movie. But all of those things, all you're doing is distracting yourself from the reality. You're taking your mind off the fact that you're afraid of flying and you're focusing it on something else. And so anxiety in those moments cause us to no longer be defined by who God created us to be. We actually become defined by what we do. Let me just encourage you, you are not defined by what you do. You are not defined by your circumstances. You are Intricately created by God for God, and you have a divine purpose. So Martha obviously loves Jesus, clearly, and she wants to serve Jesus, but she is being defined in this moment by her hospitality to Jesus. And what is driving this is her fear. She is afraid that if her house is not clean, Jesus will not love her. She is afraid if the food is not prepared fast enough or good enough, that Jesus will not love her as much. I don't know about you, but that's a real thing in my life. Right? I feel like many times if I don't meet certain standards, Jesus will not love me as much. And what happens is she is so distracted that she literally places an idol. He's, he's there. And she's like, look, i got to get this place closed. And what happens, she falls into this trap of performance-based approval. Right? I said earlier, I believe all of us have a God-given desire to be approved. And we try to do it on our performance. Right? And we can even do it with church stuff. Now, let me just preface what I'm fixing to say. All of these things are vitally important in the walk of the believer. But you're not approved because you're Bible. You're not approved because you come to church. You're not approved because you 
go to the Sunday school class or go to the small group or go to the youth group. You're not approved. You're approved because Jesus died on the cross and granted you approval. And so we cannot fall into the trap of performance-based approval. Now I think Martha knew to follow Jesus. I'm not trying to villainize her. I think she did. I think she fell into a trap. And I think for me, one way this personally affects me, and I would dare to say it affects a lot of us in this room, is through social media. I'm in, I'm in college ministry. Before I was in college ministry, I actually deleted all my social media. It was one of the greatest two years of my life. And I just got rid of it. And, um, but being in collegiate ministry, we use it a lot. It's, it's kind of important. But I can tell you that I can easily waste hours in a day scrolling through social media. And what I do is compare my life to other people. Like that's what it's for, basically. And so when that happens, I begin to be distracted from the fact that I am who God says I am. That song is so fitting that we just sang. I can forget that. And I can be distracted from that and say, well, I am not satisfied with who I am because I don't have what they have or look like they look or do what they do. I'm so distracted. And what happens in those moments is I lose sight of my sinfulness. And I lose sight of my salvation. And you cannot lose, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. But you can lose sight of it. And you lose sight of your sinfulness. You lose sight of your need for a Savior. You lose sight of your need for a Savior. Jesus is no longer the one thing. Because it doesn't matter anymore in the brain. You're focused on something else. You're distracted on something totally else. And then our focus becomes like, okay, we, we have a revelation. If we're a believer in Jesus, or if you're not, we'll walk down both paths. So let's say you're not a believer in Jesus, and you realize you're playing the comparison game. But you don't know Jesus, so you just automatically think, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to work twice as hard. I'm going to make twice as much money. I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to go to college and get three degrees and all this stuff to achieve that. And like us as believers, sometimes we look at that and we're like, yeah, but you won't work. But then what we do is we try to do it on our own. So I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to go to church every time the doors are open. I'm going to do all this stuff, but we're doing it on our own power. And we can't. We simply do not have the power to do that. What we have to do is simply be Jesus and lean in and let the Spirit of God empower us to walk as He is calling us. And here's what happened. This is where this gets really scary for me as a pastor. God has given everybody in this room influence. You have influence over people. You cannot separate yourself from the influence of those around you. Right now, we are influencing each other. And what happens is when we lose sight of Jesus, and we begin to let our one thing be something other than Jesus, our influence automatically shifts to an obstacle. Because when people look at us as Christians or church people and we go to church on Sunday and we live our life during the week with something else as our one thing, we're not projecting the gospel. We're projecting some weird, syncretistic, blended view of faith that's not real. That, to me, is a gigantic motivation to make sure that I can do this all. And I have to tell myself that every day. Because... When we do that, we become an obstacle for people coming to faith. Now, we can't save people. Only the Spirit of God draws people, but we can become an obstacle. And so you see this situation happen. You see Martha with this anxiety, this worry, and then she voices it. Right? She voices her anxiety because she's like, Jesus, I need you to tell her to do something because she's not helping me. And here's what that means. What we say reveals what our own thing is. What we do with our life reveals what our one thing is. We can come to church every Sunday. But if our life doesn't reflect that Jesus is our one thing, you're never going to be perfect. But if it's not the most of the time one thing, then what we project is a different one thing. So you have to evaluate. You have to evaluate yourself like one of the greatest questions somebody told me, and I tell our students that we have this all the time, 
Look, if somebody started following you today that didn't know you, were the leaders of Jesus or the world? Because there's only two options. And it's either, there's really only two options for the one thing. It's either Jesus or the world. And sometimes that's a scary question for me to deal with in my own personal life. A lot of times I'm like, hmm. So what we outwardly express, what we say, what we do, and how we live reveals what our one thing is. And I think we battle this every day. Like, I think we do this. And it's a battle. Like, you're, you're not going to just miraculously flip a switch and then go away. But I just made a list of stuff that we have going on in life. Right? You got homework, sports, bills, yard work, housework, parenting, laundry, dishes, cleaning, TV, books, social media. All that stuff, right? That's a whole bunch of basketball that we try to keep up. None of those things are bad. Martha's desire to serve Jesus is not bad. But when the sum of all of those things become the one thing, which is basically distraction, we're in sin. We have fallen into worshiping distraction, which is crazy to think about, but we do it so easily. And so when we do that, we begin to be defined by what we do rather than who we create. Here's what happens, I think. Mean, I think many times we get so distracted with things that we forget someone. We forget Jesus and the gospel and what he did for us. We, we get so distracted by things. I think Mary did not let Jesus walk into the door of their house to distract her from who he really was. But Martha did. Martha was just like, oh, we've got to clean everything up. We gotta cook. So don't get so wrapped up in what you do that you forget who you were created to be. Like you, you can't let these things completely stop. I understand that, but you have to let Jesus be the one thing. Most of the time, I think we have really good intentions. We want to serve Jesus. We want to live our lives for God. I don't think anybody here has evil intentions, but it's so easy to be distracted fall into that trap. And what typically, if we evaluate our lives, the thing that we have failed to do, when we don't make Jesus the one thing, is we don't sit it. Now, if Jesus literally walked into those back door, we would fall on our face and worship him. Like we would. We'd be like, that's Jesus. But we don't have that. So it takes a little bit more effort on our part of the day for us to Make sitting at the feet of Jesus a priority. And for you students in here, let me just tell you, make it a priority now. Because the older you get, the harder it gets. And I, I've seen students come in, I'm not trying to diverge onto a student message, but I just want to talk for a second because as a college pastor, I've seen so many students come to college and they've never made sitting at the feet of Jesus a priority. They come to me the second semester and their life is a wreck. And they've made poor decisions and they've done things they've never thought they would do because they lost sight of their need for Jesus. But I've also seen students who made it a priority when they were at your age. And they come to college and they're rock stars for Jesus. I got two guys in our, in our ministry right now that if I told them to go plant a church, they could do it and be successful. And they're, they're soft. So make it a priority now to sit at the feet of Jesus every day. Because here's the deal. All the stuff we do, right? One day, I do this when you over your kids off this time. One day we won't be able to work anymore. Like we won't. One day our ability to care for our family will be gone. And, and that's sad. I'm not trying to be that's just reality. I'm living proof of this. One day, you will no longer be able to play sports. You know, arthritis in both knees. So it's not very smart for you to play. But nobody can take away your relationship with Jesus. Nobody. So you have, you, if you put your hope in these one things that can go away, when they go away, all of a sudden, you don't have hope anymore. I'm, a, I'm a, an illustration. Helps me think. So, I lost my dad four years ago to cancer. Um, 
I don't say that like as a PG story, I just it's a fun story. Um, but he was a tinker. Um, he loved to work on stuff. We would he loved to buy old Ford Asian tractors. They were like it's like a tank. It doesn't really ever feel bad. And we would buy them. And basically what we would do is we would disassemble most of it and we would paint it. And that would be the extent of a lot of times what we did. I mean, we would change stuff that was, didn't work, but right? and then we turn around and flip it for a pretty good chunk of profit. And so we did that together a lot, all as I was growing up. But most of those tractors probably don't know it. They sure don't look good anymore. But the memories I have of Dad talking to me about life, how to do stuff, will never go away. It's the same way with Jesus. Spend time sitting at his feet. So how do we do this, right? Because I think we all understand that we need to do that. So how do we do that? So Mary and Martha were sitting there with Jesus physically, but we don't have that. So I think the hard part for us is we're talking about how exhausting, right? How exhausting this generation is. And we think about stuff, whether it's a faith or not, is I don't have time for that. Right? My wife, who um, is wise in her years, one time I was saying, I don't have enough time. And I remember we were sitting, we were in a house, I remember sitting right over and she looked across the table at me and she said, you know, he's got me time. And he gave us 24 hours a day. He got enough. And it just floored me, like, she's right. If I believe in the sovereignty of God, I believe in his power, then I believe that we have the exact amount of power that they need. So how do you do that? How do you make time for Jesus? You've got to let these things stop. Now, I'm not saying you quit your job. I'm not saying you quit taking care of your family. Saying you quit taking care, you quit playing sports. I'm saying you focus on this and use these things for this. God has equipped each person in this room, if you're a believer in Jesus, very specifically to make disciples of Jesus. And not everybody is equipped as a pastor to do that, but we're all called to do that. And so, for a lot of people, their primary avenue to make disciples is their job. Is your workplace. Because as you as you focus on Jesus as your one thing, this becomes a natural mission field for you to make disciples. And for you students in your sports, this is a great mission field. God has uniquely gifted you to leverage this as you make Jesus your one thing to make disciples of Jesus. There it is. This is our disciples. Parents, we are making disciples out of our kids or something. You cannot say that I don't make a disciple because we do. It's what do you make a disciple of? And if we're going to effectively do any of this for Jesus, we have to quit letting those be the one thing and make this the one thing. And as we pursue Jesus, these things will become avenues for us to live out our faith in a real and tangible way. Way. You will have gospel conversations at practice and at work and with your kids. And God will use you in miraculous ways. Now here's what I would like to challenge you. Because this is the time of year, right? Summertime, I mean, we tend to slow down and everything. Right? We're sleeping in. A, one of the greatest things about working at Williams in the summer is um, I'm a 12-month contract, so I can work all summer. But I don't have to be in the office till 9 o'clock. So my kids are out of school. My wife only works a couple days a week. So I sleep in. Um, and I get to just hang out. And it's easy to put stuff like sitting at the feet of Jesus on the back burner. I love summer. I'm on vacation. I'm not going to do that. Right? And then it turns in. It's a snowball effect. Like you miss one day. And it's like, well, I'll read tomorrow. And then you miss two days. You're like, ah. Before you know it, you're like, well, I'll get back in the rhythm of that whenever school starts. Here's what I want to challenge. What would it look like? What would it look like if this group of people in Manila, Arkansas, took the next four weeks of summer and made sitting at the feet of Jesus a problem? Like, it, it would change the face of this community. And I'm not saying this community is bad. It would make it more and more for Jesus. What would that look like? And what, what would your sports team do? What would your job look like? What would your neighborhood look like if we spent the next 
four weeks with the priority of our lives, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he's telling us to do, and obeying. Man, that's how revival starts. Revival starts at the feet of Jesus. So what does that mean? Apart from that challenge, what does that mean? All right, so how do you how do you make it a priority? How do you start? Well, I think the first thing is Mary and Martha recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Now, that's a big word that we don't use outside of church. But basically, it's, it's full of context. Because what they're saying is we realize because they use the word Messiah that they need redemption. They need to be redeemed. And then they realize that Jesus is the only way to find that redemption. I'm not naive in a room this size with this many people, but there's people here that need Jesus. Like you need to kneel at the feet of Jesus for the first time. You realize you've been trying to find value from job and school and relationships and money and stuff, and it's never enough. And for the first time, maybe the Spirit of God has pierced your heart and said, You need to build my feet and surrender your life. And I want to give you an opportunity. Now, for the rest of us, there's, there's probably two big segments. Some of us in this room know Jesus, but we have been letting ourselves be distracted. And just so you know, that's me. Anytime I preach, I have to repent like the whole week I'm preparing because God just gets a hold of me. And over the last week, I've been very repentant of the fact that I have been worshiping all of these other things that so if that's you, if you realize, man, I, I've been trying so hard to keep all these things going. And you realize that. Well, then that's a position of sin, right? A sin. And it's not a sin in a way that causes you to lose salvation. But the only proper response to sin is repentance. So just a minute we're saying and stuff, man, just repent. Just pray and ask God. Say, I'm sorry, I repent of that. And I want to make you my one thing all the time. Now, for all of us, I want to invite you. I, I, I may put you out of your comfort zone a little bit. Here's what I want to invite you to do. We have a unique opportunity to be in the church this morning to actually be able to be with Jesus. So what I encourage you to do, whether you come forward and you kneel at the altar, you kneel in your seat, or maybe you just kind of can't physically kneel, like I probably wouldn't kneel because it would hurt my knees. But in your brain, just kneel before the Savior and see what he has for you. Because here's what I mean. God has something for you tomorrow, today. He has a message for you. He has a calling for you. And it could start right now. If you kneel before him and listen to what he has to say for us. So as we say, you feel free if you want to come forward and kneel where you are or just in your brain as you stand to worship. But I encourage you, kneel before Jesus today. And let's start something that moves beyond anything bigger than so I'm going to pray in just a minute. Chris is going to come up. The worship team is going to come up. And you just respond however you feel like you can respond. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, your goodness. Lord, I thank you that even though we get so distracted, Lord, you allow us peace as we come to you. Lord, that we as sinful, unholy people would have the privilege and the ability to kneel before a holy person. I pray that we never take that for granted. Lord, for the person in this room that needs you, and needs to know you, needs to be saved today, Lord, I pray you would, through your spirit, empower them to Lord, you stand up, come and talk to you, Chris, accept you, Lord. God, I pray for this congregation, Lord. I, I, I have total uh, just hope and faith in what you're doing here, Lord, and I know uh, Matt and Chris are, are in tune with you and your spirit, so I pray God you to move in and through these people. Lord, we're so grateful to come to In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you, Hayes, for bringing that last real quick. If our ushers will come forward, and we'll prepare to take the offering this morning. Uh, so bow to you real quick as we pray for our offering. Lord, we thank you uh, for this day. Lord, we thank you for the word of Ms. Sean, uh, Hayes, the good callers of you, not with faith, the world distracted, but to be focused just on you and our time to be And God, we enter this time uh, of, of tithing, Lord, I pray that we'll be to that, Lord, to give you our first fruits uh, so that this church and this better reach this community and serve you. And our pleasure to take this time and help us to be good stewards of it. 